Okay, well, let's have a, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for just the privilege we have of coming together as a church family this morning. And Lord, we, uh, we think of, of Scotty and Mary this morning. We know their facility was shut down, so they're not able to, to come and join us and not even, even able to leave their room. We just pray that you would, uh, you'd be undertaking for them. And we think of, of uh, the Wilkenings and Mark passed away last night. We just pray that you'd be, be encouraging that family and just wrap your arms around them. We also think of Jason as he has COVID and we just pray that you would, you would raise him up to health again. And Father, we again thank you for the privilege we have of knowing you as Savior and the way that you, you undertake for us, Lord, in our, just for each of our needs, no matter how unimportant they may seem, Lord, that you take, take our lives seriously and undertake for us. We pray for our military people this morning and our law enforcement people. We pray that you would watch over and protect them as they protect us. We pray for our nation in this uh, very uncertain days, Lord. We pray that you would be drawing hearts and minds to yourself and that our nation's leaders also that you would draw them to yourself. And again, we, we thank you for just our time together. We pray that you would open the eyes of our understanding now as we look into your word and you would help us to really Glean what you'd like to teach us today in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we there we go. We're working. We want to. I want to read a few verses from John chapter nine. Uh, we've been going over the life of Christ. And so John chapter 9, the first five verses, say, Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Well, as we have, uh, as I've mentioned every week since we've been in the, the life of Christ, Jesus came to earth as God in the flesh. And as we follow his earthly ministry, there are several significant things that we will continue to notice. Uh, we'll continue to see that... Uh, Everything Jesus does is intentional. He's, uh, he's on a, a mission. He's guided by a plan. And the second thing we notice is that uh, we constantly see a contrast between the goodness of God and the sinfulness of man. And the third thing we notice is that all through the Gospels, Jesus is constantly challenging the Jewish culture. Every area of the Jewish worldview that is inconsistent with the character of God, Jesus calls into question. And finally, the narratives that we have in Scripture give us a clear picture of how Jesus interacted with people of that day. And since God is unchangeable, we can be sure that in the same way he interacted with them, he will interact with us. Now, during our study, I mentioned that Jesus' earthly ministry was divided up into three three different years. And um, the, the first year is referred to as the year of inauguration. The second year is the year of popularity. And the, th the third and final year is the year of opposition. Now this morning, we're moving into the year of opposition, this third and final year of, of his earthly ministry. You know, and as uh, we've made this journey through the Gospels, we have seen how the life of Jesus gives us a picture of the character of God. We've also seen how his teaching reveals the heart of man. Now this morning, we're going to cover most of chapters 9 and 10 of, uh, of John. And this, this section of Scripture gives us two seemingly different subjects. 
One is Jesus healing a man who was blind since birth, and the other is the story of the Good Shepherd. Now, these two incidents are actually connected. Uh, in them, Jesus gives us a picture of the scribes and Pharisees who were false shepherds of Israel. And he compares them with himself, the good shepherd. Now, I'm going to, to start this morning by just telling the story, since it would take too long to read through it in, uh, in uh, John chapter 9, about this man who was born blind that Jesus healed. As Jesus was walking along with his disciples, he saw a man who had been blind from birth. Teacher, his disciples ask him, why was this man born blind? Was it as a result of his sin or his parents' sin? Disciples ask this because the Pharisees taught that all sickness, even birth defects, were a result of sin. They believed that a person could even sin in the womb. And it was not because of it, it, it was not because of his sin or his parents' sin, Jesus answered. He was born uh, blind so the power of God could be revealed through him. Now, then Jesus spit on the ground and made mud with the, the saliva, his saliva and smoothed the mud over the blind man's eyes. And then he told him, go and wash in the pool of Siloam. And so the man went and washed and came back seeing. His neighbors and others who knew him as a blind beggar asked each other, is this the man that begged? Some said he was. Others said, no, he isn't, but it certainly looks like him. And the beggar kept saying, I am the man. I'm the same man. And finally someone asked, who healed you? What happened? And he told them, the man they called Jesus made mud and smoothed it over my eyes and, and told me to go and wash in the pool of Siloam. So I went and washed, and now I can see. Where's Jesus now? They asked. And he replied, I don't, he replied, I don't know. Then he took him to the Pharisees. Jesus had healed this man on the Sabbath. And when the Pharisees asked about his healing, he told them, well, he smoothed the mud over my eyes and, and when it was washed away I could see. Some of the Pharisees said this man Jesus is not from God for he is working on the Sabbath. Others said but how could an ordinary sinner do such a miraculous deed? So there was a deep division among them and then the Pharisees once again questioned the man who had been blind and demanded to know about Jesus and the man replied I think he was a pro or I think he is a prophet the Jewish leaders would not believe that he had been blind and so they called his parents and they asked them is this your son was he born blind if so how is it that he can now see His parents replied, we know this is our son, we know that he was born blind, but we don't know how he can see or who healed him. He's old enough, let him speak for himself. They said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who had announced that anyone saying that Jesus was the Messiah would be expelled from the synagogue. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind and told him, Give glory to God, but tell us the truth. Because we know Jesus was a sinner, or is a sinner. And the man replied, I don't know whether he's a sinner or not, but I know that I was blind, and now I can see. But what did he do? They ask. How did he heal you? Look, the man exclaimed, I told you once. You, didn't you listen? Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become one of his disciples too? And then they cursed him and said, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know God spoke to Moses. 
But as, to, as for this man, we know nothing about him. This is very strange, the man replied. He healed my eyes, and yet you don't know anything about him. Everyone knows that God doesn't listen to sinners, but he's ready to hear from those he, who worship him. Never since the world began has anyone been able to open the, blind, the eyes of someone born blind. If this man were not from God, he could, do, he could do nothing. Now remember, the Pharisees believed that birth defects were the cause of someone sinning in the womb. Either that or their parents sinned. And Jesus had answered that. So then the Pharisees answered and they said this, You were born in sin. Are you trying to teach us? And they threw him out of the synagogue. Well, we'll continue by just reading uh, John 9, 35 through 38. Jesus answered that they, or when Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and when he had found him, he said to him, Do you believe in the Son of God? And he answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and it is he who is talking with you. And then he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Now, notice, uh, notice how Jesus treated this man. He knew he'd been thrown out of the synagogue, and he went to find him. Notice that Jesus takes the initiative. He sought the man out. You know, God does this in our lives, too. In John 9, 39 through 41, so then Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may be made blind. And then some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these words and said to him, Are we blind too? So Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no sin, but now you say we see, and therefore your sin remains. Notice that the Pharisees were present with him when Jesus found the man he healed, and they questioned Jesus as to what Jesus said to him. They asked him, are we blind also? Now the Pharisees saw themselves as righteous. And even after witnessing miracle after miracle, they did not accept Jesus as the Messiah. They did not believe the Messiah would do things contrary to, to their oral law, or accept the social and moral outcasts that Jesus accepted. The Pharisees thought of themselves as enlightened and wise, and in their wisdom, they had rejected Jesus and his claim to be from God. They saw in themselves no need to repent. Their own righteousness had blinded them from the truth. And their spiritual blindness was obvious because of their prejudices. If they truly saw themselves as they were in spiritual darkness, they would have reached out to Jesus for help. Now, in our Bibles, we have a chapter division right here. But in reality, the text, the context flows right into chapter 10 and is continued on through verse 21. Jesus indicated to Israel that just as he healed this man from his physical blindness, he could also heal men from spiritual blindness. And in the next passage, we see Jesus refers to himself as the Good Shepherd. There we go. Uh, the compassion here, or the comparison here, is... Uh, that the Pharisees were also shepherds of Israel. And that's what we've got to keep in, keep in mind. They were false shepherds, having no real concern for the welfare of the flock. During the time of Christ, seeing a shepherd leading his flock uh, to pasture was a very common sight. And before we get into the, the passage on the good shepherd, though, we need to understand why Jesus used sheep as an illustration. Without a shepherd, sheep are helpless. Um, they're easily, an easy target for beasts of prey. Sheep have no def, uh, defenses. 
They have neither sharp teeth nor powerful kicks. A ram can, can butt with his horns, but a female sheep can only bleat for help. Sheep will not drink from fast-moving water or from, or from a stagnant pool. Uh, they depended on the shepherd to dam up fresh-running water and slow it down, creating a pool for, so that they could drink. Sheep are also, they also have a propensity to get themselves into situation um, they have no ability to get out of. Without the help of a, of a shepherd watching over them, they can easily get lost or injured. Now this, more than anything else, makes them similar to people. Now in... Uh, this thing is not kind of cooperating today, but in Isaiah 1.3 it says, The ox knows its owner and the donkey its master's crib, but Israel doesn't know. My people do not consider. Now here Isaiah makes an observation that the people of Israel were, were different than an ox or a donkey. These two creatures knew where to go and get nourishment compared to Israel who did not. Sheep cannot even find grazing pasture on their own. During Bible times, the, the Jewish shepherd would, would often put goats among his sheep because the goats would lead the sheep to fresh grass. Goats were very helpful and useful to shepherds. Now I'm going to make a comparison here, and, and uh, you be careful now, don't take this too far. It's interesting when we compare this to the church. Within each body of believers, God places certain individuals who have a gift for leading others to green pastures of spiritual refreshment. But is it proper to refer to them as old goats? <laughs> if it is, we have several in our midst. Well, things are going well today. In John 10, 1 through 5, it says, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way. The same is the thief and a robber, but he who enters the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice, and they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of a stranger. A sheepfold is actually a large, enclo large enclosure with many flocks uh, that could be kept at once, and every night a guard was placed at the door of the sheepfold. Now the reason I put this thing here is so I can use it periodically. The guard is right here. Many uh, of the sheepfolds in that day were very large, and uh, it was possible for a thief to climb unnoticed over the wall and, and steal some of the sheep. So a doorkeeper or guard was placed over each fold, and the doorkeeper knew each shepherd, and when the shepherds came in the morning, they would enter the door and call their sheep, and the sheep knew the voice of their own shepherd, and when the sheep heard their shepherd, they would separate themselves from the other sheep and follow him through the door. Now the sheepfold is a picture, this sheepfold is a picture of the nation of Israel. This is what Jesus was referring to. Jesus came to Israel legally through the door. He was their Messiah. Jesus was the fulfillment of all the Old Testament prophecy. He was the only person who ever walked this earth that could meet all the criteria that was in place. Remember, we went over that. And even though he was the rightful shepherd of Israel, Jesus made it plain that not every sheep in the fold was his. He, was, uh, he, he said his sheep would hear his voice and would follow him. Now, there were other shepherds. And many in Israel followed these false shepherds who cared little for the sheep. God continually warned his people about these false shepherds. In Jeremiah uh, 50, verse 6, it says, My people 
have been lost sheep. Their shepherds have led them astray. They have turned them away on the mountains. They have gone from mountain to hill. They have forgotten their resting place. Now, now keep the context in mind here. The scribes and Pharisees were false shepherds. They had just excommunicated a man who was healed of blindness because when they questioned him about Jesus, he said this in John 9, 32 and 33. Since the world began, it has been unheard of that anyone opened the eyes of one who was born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. The man who had been blind testified that Jesus was from God. The Pharisees, being false shepherds, were not willing to accept this truth. They cared nothing about the fact that this man, formerly one of their sheep, had been healed of his blindness. As a spiritual leaders in, in Israel, they had a responsibility for the people as their shepherds. And all through the Old Testament, warnings or writings, there were, were warnings and references about false shepherds. Now, therefore, it's interesting that the people Jesus was talking to at this time missed the point that he made. He made they missed the whole point that he makes about the sheepfold. And we know that from John 10:6. So Jesus used this illustration, but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. And there's a very good reason for their, their confusion and their lack of understanding. When the Lord called himself the Good Shepherd, he was challenging the worldview of the rabbis of that time. Regardless of the fact that all through the Old Testament and the history of Israel, many of the great leaders had been herdsmen. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and David were all herders of sheep. The rabbinical writings during the time of Jesus speak very negatively about shepherds. Shepherds were among the despised trades. They were considered to be at the bottom of the social order by the religious leaders and educated men of that day. Shepherds were not allowed to hold public office, and they couldn't even witness in a trial. So again, Jesus confronted the Jewish worldview. And Jesus reminded the people that God saw them as sheep needing a shepherd, and that he was the good shepherd. Many of the people, because of their own biases, missed the heart of Jesus' message. And I think that sometimes happens to you and I. Our own biases can keep us from embracing the truth. It is always God's purpose that we understand his will. That's the reason he gave us his word. God's purpose was never to keep us in the dark, but to let us know his, his mind. And that's why Jesus made another comparison to help them grasp the meaning of what he was saying. In John 10, 7 through 10, he said, And Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. He said, I am, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. Jesus is our access to God. Through him, salvation was provided for mankind. He's the true shepherd. Now, there are enemies whose purpose is to steal and kill and destroy the sheep. Now, the good shepherd has come to give life. And not just life, but meaningful and abundant life. In John 10, 11 through 14, it says, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, 
and am known by my own. The good shepherd places the safety of the sheep above his own welfare. Now the scribes and Pharisees are pictured as hirelings. The hireling really has no genuine concern for the sheep. He may, he may be an expert on how sheep are supposed to act. He may know the shepherding manual forwards and backwards. But the test of a true shepherd does not center on the reading of the manual. It centers on his care and concern for the sheep. Now there's never been a group of people that were more educated and knowledgeable in regard to the scripture than the scribes and the Pharisees. But they were also false shepherds of Israel. Now I'm not suggesting that knowledge of the word of God is a negative. If it is, I've wasted the last 50 years of my life. But there's a fundamental flaw in the Pharisees' approach to Scripture. To them, it was all academic. It was the letter of the law that mattered. They missed the purpose behind God giving the written word. God gave us the Bible so that we would know His character and His love. God desired that we develop and enjoy the type of relationship with our Creator that enables us to reflect his character. And that only comes when, we, when we're close enough to him, we can, we, can, we can reflect his character. The Pharisees, however, never moved beyond the written word to a relationship. The written scripture became their focus instead of God being their focus. Now this is common among legalistic people. And many people who are legalistic don't even realize they're legalistic. You know, God tests me in interesting ways. I shared with you in the past about the, the church in Coeur d'Alene that used to support Janet and I when we were on the field. If you were to look at that church's doctrinal statement, it was bulletproof. Every item was clearly presented from Scripture. The teaching was, was good. The exegesis of Scripture was excellent. <clears throat> the pastor at that time was Greek, and he had a superb grasp of ancient languages. Everyone in that church memorized Scripture constantly. But if a lady came to that church wearing pants, even if it was a nice pantsuit, the ushers would turn her away at the door. And you, I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. If a man showed up unshaven with clothing a little soil, the same thing might happen to him. If a man happened to be wearing pastel colors, boy, I would be in trouble. That might not get him an invitation to leave, but uh, you could bet that uh, he'd be talked to because, you know, it's a sin for men to wear pastel colors. I don't know if you knew that. You had to dress a certain way, wear your hair a certain way, speak a certain way, and act a certain way to be part of that church. I don't know how they ever put up with Janet and I. Because she is a real problem. <laughs> if you were to tell them that... Uh, that they weren't very Christ-like, which I don't think they were, they would have been shocked. They saw themselves as very godly people. False godliness, apart from a genuine relationship with God, is just another form of religion. And religion has plagued the church since the day it was founded. It's plagued the church since Pentecost. God, speaking to Israel through the prophet Hosea, said this in Hosea 6.6, 6, For I desire mercy and not sacrifice and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. Quit going through the motions. I have something better for you than religion. And notice this doesn't say knowledge about God, but knowledge of God, knowledge of His character of his care for mankind and knowledge of his love. Jesus 
trying to help the Pharisees understand God's concern for individuals. He reminded them of this Old Testament writing in Matthew, Matthew 12, 7. He says, but if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. Now Paul gives the same warning to New Testament shepherds in, in 2 Corinthians 3, 6 who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Jesus was a minister of grace, and his instructions to under-shepherds or anyone who is responsible for others in the body of Christ were instructions of grace. In John 10, 15 through 16, it says... As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. I mentioned uh, before that, that the sheepfold was a picture of Israel. And G Jesus says, uh, other sheep I have which are not of this fold, other sheep that are non-Israel. And this is the same message that, that Jesus was preaching in the early days of his, of his earthly ministry. That's why he took the disciples. First thing he did is take them through Samaria. And in Samaria he made the statement, lift up your eyes. For the, wheel, the fields are white into harvest. Jesus had a heart for the world. And when he said, uh, they will hear my voice and they will be one flock and one shepherd, he was speaking to the church or speaking of the church. The church is universal, and it reaches all cultures and is made up of every person who has placed their trust in, in Christ as their Savior. In John 10, 17 through 18, it says, Therefore my Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. Now remember, this takes place, this is the very beginning of the last year of his earthly ministry. And he makes this statement, I lay down my life that I may take it again. He is preparing the disciples for the crucifixion. He is God. He knows what is ahead. And in John 10, 19 through 21, it says, Therefore, there was a division again among the Jews because of these sayings. And many of them said, he has a demon and is mad. Why do you listen to him? Others said, these are not the words of one who has a demon. And can a demon open the eyes of the blind? You see how these two chapters are connected. Even though the Pharisees were false shepherds, they were followed by many in Israel. But not all the Israelites looked to the Pharisees. There were those who understood that only God could do what Jesus had done. Well, I need to, to wrap this up. But as we have uh, journeyed through the Gospels, we constantly see how the life of Jesus gives us a picture of the character of God and how his teachings reveal the heart of man. The Pharisees were false shepherds because they never recognized that God's desire for mankind reached beyond the letter of the law. They never accepted Jesus as God in the flesh. Now we can use these same criteria to recognize false shepherds today. If someone insists that a relationship with God is only possible through keeping the letter of the law or make up their own rules like... Uh, you know, men can't wear pastel colors. You might want to question that. Or if they do not recognize the rightful place of Jesus as God, they're false shepherds. Now, as I read through this this week and went through this, I had to consider my own ministry. What kind of an under-shepherd am I? Do I approach God's people as a hireling? Do I, I study God's word 
like the scribes and Pharisees, seeking for, from Scripture a means to find fault in others? Or do I, with Jesus as my model, seek to encourage others on to maturity in Christ? You know, it's my, my desire that others reach their full potential and experience the abundant life that Jesus spoke of. 1 Timothy 1.5 says, Now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart and from a good conscience and from sincere faith. If I use Scripture as it says here, I can't help but model the example of the Good Shepherd. And if I'm really following God, if I am walking with the Lord Jesus Christ, the fruit of the Spirit will be evident in my life, which, and I go over this often. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, and self-control. If there's not love and joy and peace and those things in my life, my life is characterized by turmoil and anger and frustration, I'm not walking with God. Pretty simple. I can, I can show anger and frustration and, and be a violent individual and go to the Ten Commandments and say, yep, haven't murdered anybody today, I'm doing, I'm doing good. But if I'm really a genuine believer and I'm walking with the Lord Jesus Christ, it's the fruit of the Spirit that's going to be evident in my life and that's going to be reflected because of my walk with God. Not because I'm, I'm sticking close to the letter of the law, but I'm sticking close to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm also going to do all those other things too. I'm going to be faithful to my wife, and I'm not going to steal, I'm not going to do those things, because I'm sticking close to the Lord Jesus Christ. That makes the difference. Okay, well thank you for listening today.